Hi, how's it? We're in the next part, all right? Now, in the previous part, I was speaking about the judgment on the wicked and how it suddenly comes on them uh, and they didn't expect it coming. And the reason why it is so sudden is because God has handed them over. Uh, they watch the righteous rise and fall and rise and fall and get up each time. They're not given another shot, if you know what I mean. Now, with um, darkness, I was speaking about how in the run-up to me coming to Christ, I always feared the unknown. So I just did not mess with it at all. One of the biggest reasons I believe that that was the case for me was because God did not want me dabbling in something that he knew that once I, I experimented with it, I would just get taken away. I naturally have a predisposition for just operating in spiritual stuff heavily. I was put in that by my genes, my spiritual genes. My family adore themselves some witchcraft and they are ever like experimenting with the occult in whatever capacity or even like they just, they don't do normal spiritual, like they don't try, they don't try things. How can I describe my family? It's like some people take a line of cocaine and they never go back. They were just experimenting and that's it. But others get addicted from the first shoot up, from the first schnaff up. My family members are like ones who, when they schnaff even one spell, they're gone. They get taken, they get made addicts from one experimentation with a drug. That's what's good. They are addicted to the darkness and they just keep getting darker and darker in it. That is a predisposition in me. And there's a predisposition in some people. Others are better than others. There are people who experiment with sorcery once and never go back. But there are others that can't afford to. And I was one of those. So for those reasons, God made me nervous with all things spiritual ever since that event that happened that I spoke about in my earlier parts. In primary school where I was made to, like, I had a fit, an epileptic fit, some seizure or a, a demonic convulsion because of allowing some girl to do some hypnotic ritual on me due to me trying to test or rather disprove that it is it was actually working on all the other girls. Ever since then, I've just steer, steered clear of funny little weird things. I've always steered clear, right? So nobody could ever convince me to try a spell, to visit a sangoma to see if I can't get the job. Like no one could ever, ever speak me into speak, convince me to try stuff like that. The same thing is also true with, with drugs. Drugs can enter a person into the metaphysical um, space. I had an ex-boyfriend that was a dabbler violently. <laughs> he was just a user. Uh, to call him a dabbler is an understatement. And I tried to get him off drugs and he wouldn't. And there was uh, there was this one holiday that we went on together with another couple. The three of them went and took something and they didn't even tell me about it because my ex knew how strict I was when it came to that. I did not want my mind altered. I had smoked weed when I was a guys, yes, the Lord has been with me so much. I, I experimented with weed when I was a teenager. A lot of people speak about uh, Zol, marijuana, making them laugh, hungry, all these things. It made me feel like I was losing my mind. It, it made me sad. Like, it just made me really sad. And I remember one time when I was high, I felt like I was losing my actual mind or my intelligence. I was very smart in school. I remember doing math equations in my head to figure out if I can still calculate. Because inside my high, I felt like I was losing my mind. I never did it again. It made me feel terrible. And I never got hungry, neither did I laugh. I just hated it. I, was, I experimented with, with ecstasy once, a quarter of a pill that I took. I couldn't feel myself from a quarter of a pill. I could not feel myself. Like, my, I, I woke up in the morning and aware, like literally, I could not feel physical touch senses around me. They just went numb. Ever since that day, that was uh, some, uh, let's say maybe a year after experimenting with marijuana. Uh, that event with the uh, ecstasy ecstasy is supposed to make you happy excited want to you know try everything it just made me numb to a point where i couldn't feel anything so i could have cut myself and watched myself bleed and nothing happened and i was aware of this inside the high so it's not like i was uh, i know like it's god just gave me an awareness inside the high that this thing is dangerous and that was the last drug i ever took i never tried again i stayed with cigarettes i quit them later but god has just never allowed destructive habits to stick with me because they did stuff to me spiritually that it that 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 those same drugs did not do to other people when people are on marijuana the mind altering activity is they just get excited they get happy they smile they want to eat and they just want to have talk up a storm they talk a lot i got depressed it's almost your know, guys it's almost as if though the moment i compromise myself in any way spiritually demons just pounced on me i don't know why perhaps 
I was dedicated to God as a child in some spiritual realm that I don't understand. Like maybe some people just have something about them from birth that devils know that if they can catch this one early, they can they, they are preventing something from happening in the future through this individual. But there was something that I was carrying that made it such that the smallest little compromise just was an overreaction in my body. An overreaction. Like I had an epileptic fit when that one little hypnotic thing was down on me uh, while everybody else just fainted and woke up normally the weed made me feel morbidly depressed and like i was losing my mind and ecstasy made me feel like i can't feel my body i could have committed suicide jumped off a building thinking i'm not gonna feel anything on a quarter of a tablet yeah ecstasy so basically all these things that can cause a person to go deep into something that will put them in a rabbit hole that will send them to the abyss the lord like nipped it in the bud he gave me an acuteness of understanding inside a high or inside some funny state that were like inside my highs i just had understanding that this stuff is bad it did things just never stuck to me even cigarette smoking nikki foster i never liked it i never got addicted i quit cigarettes cold turkey i just stopped one day like this we just i just stopped okay grand cat go I just one day stopped uh, because I was never addicted. I was following peer pressure. God never let me get addicted to cigarettes despite just smoking them for a couple of years. And he never let me ever get to a point where drugs now, um, I'm, I'm busy, you know, using them to cope or whatever. Because he knew, ish, he knew the cat's gonna bother me. All right. The Lord knew that, um, or not. He knew that uh, I could not afford to get too deep into anything that can alter my mind and get me into the metaphysical realm because I had a spiritual gift that the devil would have wanted to use for his kingdom, right? He would have wanted to recruit me into the darkness and in that space I would have probably been one of those really hectically uh, seeing and descending and just spiritually like buffed up, beefed up people. Baba Sibili, like these eerie, weird, psychic randoms and medium randoms that just are just freakishly accurate with predictions and stuff like that. One of those, no, dude, this one, look, she's, she's not a fake, hey, she's the real deal. Yeah, I would have been one of those. One of those and it would have given me a pump like a ha huh, i'm spiritually gifted oh uh, i i i am real like clairvoyant or i am real you know like yeah the dreams are good they're the real deal i would have been used mightily by the devil and he saw that yeah before i even in and of myself walked in the gifting in christ uh, i already had some kind of spiritual gift in anything yeah and though it was really negligible uh, on the come up on the run up too but it was only after coming to christ that he magnified it that he did, made it what it is basically what, what I'm dealing with today. And so still to this day, Satan is still trying to recruit me for his kingdom. And I'm like, wow, okay, you're funny. You're hilarious. Or at least he's a uh, servant. Bang, you're fooling high and low. And I'm like, you're gross. I find you gross. And I will never allow myself to walk in something that I find disgusting. So anyway, whatever. So that whole um, ignoring of spiritual activity for the sake of protecting myself from the unknown, it helped me not dabble with stuff that would have made me get deep and addicted into it. I wanted to believe that witchcraft does not work, that you know the devil might be real but god got this um and i don't even want to know what, what happens there how the lord deals with the devil like i said mm, whatever i don't care i just wanted a very fluffy uh, basically a form of godliness that denies the power thereof i was just happy to stick around with it hang ten in it and not move left or right concerning it it's this cat with the king young Bora, because like crank head make a decision what you want to do because the sooner you finish doing what you want to do the sooner i can like just move on with my life Okay, so I, I did not want, whoa, this cat, ne? Anyway, uh, a form of godliness that denies the power thereof, that's what I would have walked in, but it helped me to be that standoffish to the things of God and also the things of the spirit realm at all because it made sure that I could never ever end up a lukewarm Christian. I I, I was just a, I believed in God. I professed some kind of spiritual belief in a deity, but I never was actually in the church. I never went to Sunday services or homestyle Bible. I, I was never a lukewarm Christian. And I keep saying, I will say that over and over again, I've never been a lukewarm Christian. I've never been a lukewarm Christian. The moment I made a decision to start doing church, I got taken all together by Jesus. I have never played church in my life, not even once, right? So God, I believe, blocked that with my ignorance's bliss mindset. He prevented me from ever being lukewarm because he knew just the tempt what I would have been. I would have I would have ended up a very spiritual person that dabbles with Christianity. If you know what I mean. Like I would have if at all I would, I'd allowed myself to get lukewarm 
And if at all I then was introduced into darkness and I humored it, I let somebody train me or recruit me, I would have been literally exactly what it is that a good 80 to 90% of my enemies are. All these people that go to church on Sunday, they, they pray, but they also spell cast. I would have been involved in the church, likely maybe even as a Sunday school teacher or a member of the choir, involved in the ministry of helps and Asha, something. I would have been very involved because I, I, I was never made to take spiritual matters lightly. It was never meant to be what I do. So when I was still in the world, I ignored spiritual matters. I kept them at an arm's length. And when I finally started to pay attention to spiritual matters, I was very serious. And by the grace of God, it was Christ that I was serious about. I was never meant to be light-hearted, surface level with activity in in the in the spiritual uh, realm. So I would have been the menace that many of my enemies are today. But says like they are in the church. They are not occasional attenders of church on Easter and maybe Christmas. They are every Sunday they they attend Bible studies. They I've got one like former friend that is even an ordained elder at a church. They serve in the church, they bring casseroles, they donate a lot of money uh, to the church. They are known in the church as, you know, sister this and sister that. Like, and they attend mega churches, a lot of them. And yet they are known very particularly by pastors, by deacons, by elders, by, yeah. These are not people that are playing church. These are not people that are there only on Easter. These are people that are well recognized, known. When they walk in, they get hugged, they get acknowledged, they get mentioned, uh, you know, in meetings in churches. But they also are very deep in the occult, very deep. They mix the stuff together easily, like sugar in a hot, like cup of tea. They just dissolve Christ with the darkness and they are unfed, unfettered by, they are unbothered by that. On Wednesdays, they are consulting Asangwama. Some of them even have shrines in their own houses where they perform rituals. And then on Thursday, they're at Bible study. And then on Sunday, they're at the Sunday service in the morning. And then they go in the evening again. They volunteer on weekends, food drives, you know. Uh, I have an aunt that's like that. Food drives, uh, giving stuff over to the homeless, um, blah, 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 all that jazz. They have got full 100% activity involvement in the church, but they've also got <clears throat> full 100% involvement in the occult. They hide, however, their occult involvement. They want to look like church people. And what they're doing is they are laundering they are their wickedness with the church the reason why they get so immersed in church activity why they allow themselves to be so much like the is it is it the thyatira no not thyatira um smyrnian the reason why they're so much like the smyrnian church right it is smyrna am i right sardis no not smyrna smyrnian church i believe is actually quite holy the sardian church they've got a reputation for being alive while they are dead so everybody knows them as Pasta Chris and Pasta uh, Betty because they are happy to approve women as pastors. And every, or deacon this or deaconess that. Mm. People n know them as, as God's uh, servants. We are going to be shocked, guys, at the Great White Throne Judgment. Who is not? Who's lost? Oh, just out of our minds. Shocked, okay? Because some people that will have passed away that we will have, even as Christians, been convinced were believers weren't. Like, oh, Ravi Zacharias, if at all the scandals about him being a sexual predator did not come out, much of the body of Christ would believe that he's in heaven today. But fortunately the Lord opened us up to the understanding of his character before uh, before the Great Wrath Judgment. But there are others whose dirty laundry never came out. So we still talk about them right now today as being in heaven. But they are weeping right now where they, they are, wailing, having committed those atrocities in the sight of God who sees all things and so he cannot be mocked. These people have got a reputation for being alive. They have a reputation for being godly. They're known. Some of them are pastors over you, but they're dead. And the reason why they love church activity so much and why they also love rank and uh, status and, st and status, a position in the church is to give themselves a false sense of security. It's like their consciences are beating them down. They're making them feel uncomfortable. So they give themselves a sense of security by getting very involved in the things of Jesus. They want redemption. They want their bread buttered on both sides, basically. They want Christ to embrace them in heaven despite having been very heavily involved in the occult. They got frustrated, some of them, along the way with how things were not going or going. 
in their lives and so they used uh, witchcraft spells in order to push themselves along and the guilt that they felt made them even more effervescent in the things of God. It made them even more involved in natural physical things which we all know were not saved by works. It is the gift of God and you will know them by their fruit and no, you know, you can't dwell in the light and in the darkness at the same time. Anybody at all that is in the darkness but claims to love God, they lie. The truth of God is not in them. That is written in, in 1 John. So these people have got this like double life, the secret like under wraps life in the darkness and they launder it. They launder it like a, 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 a drug trafficker. They launder their wickedness with church activity, which is why they are ever uh, so much more involved in church activity than the regular lukewarm Christian, than the regular occasional Easter and Christmas church attendee. They, they do it precisely because it is their way to give themselves, like I said, a false sense of security. Next part.